This is a Tamura paper two from Jacqueline Tyler. She's actually written two of these. Um, I'll do the other one after this one, obviously. Cos theta is minus 0 0.6. Now that's negative. If you look at the cos graph, cos is negative between 90 and 180 specifically in this range. So that narrows down theta for us. 0 0.6 is obviously 3 fifths if you're not a pleb. And then you can draw a little triangle here because uh, Jason over problem uses cos. And then you can get this because um, it's Pythagorite. Uh, the 3, 4, 5 triangle. And then we can say tan is 4 thirds. Now, is tan plus 4 thirds or is it minus 4 thirds? Well, it's clearly minus 4 thirds because that's the only option available. May this looks like a mistype to me. Uh, maybe that was supposed to be um, one of these was supposed to be positive four thirds, and the other one just a, a thing with a root. But anyway, if we look at the tan graph, tan um, we we know the angles between ninety and one eighty, so tan is therefore negative. So it's going to be minus four thirds, and we'll have our answer of b. Question two then. So uh, find a complete set of values uh, for which this touches the curve. So it's just a discriminant check, right? B squared mass four c is bigger than or equal to zero. Um, and uh, and that's all we have to do. So we just rearrange it, we do this. Um, I did this in a fancy way. I just used difference of two squares here to factorize immediately to get me this. And now I've got roots at six and minus two. I need to be bigger than zero, so I need to be, being, I need to be either side of the roots, right? So I need to be above six or less than minus two, which is uh, this answer here. And so we'll get to question three. Positive integer n that is less than 20. So we'll immediately discount this one because that's not less than 20. It's not part of the statement. No positive integer, uh, integer n that is less than 20 can be written as the sum of two non-prime integers greater than 1. n is 8, or well, 8 is 4 plus 4, so those are two non-prime integers greater than 1. And 13 is 4 plus 9, so those two are counterexamples because they can be written as the sum of two non-primes greater than 1. Okay, uh, question 4 then. So we need to go through these in turn. If a was true, then the, all of the jars, because all of them contain the same number of things, if A was true, then the things would contain one, two, or three pounds, which would make B false. It would make C false as long as it wasn't one. So now it could be two or three. It would make D false, but E says two or three. So E would have to be true. So A isn't the true one. And we can't have um, we can't have less than four pounds because, so, because A isn't true anymore. So that leaves us with five or six, I guess, since those are the only options going up here. So let's just check B. Is, let's check B. So, well, if, if all the jars contain five or six, then A is untrue, so that's good. C is um, only untrue if it contains five, but then D is true, so B and D would be true together, so that's not correct. So I think the only thing left to say is, well, therefore, they contain four. And D is the only one that's true if they all contain four. I think that's the only conclusion we can now get. We crossed out all the others as we sort of went along working in our heads. That one took me a little while to think about, but um, I, I find questions like that quite annoying. Um, which of these are necessary uh, for the probability of having a pet to be four nights? Five children do not have a pet. Well, this could have been simplified from eight eighteenths, so ten don't. So that's not necessary. Number of children in a group is by four. Well, clearly there's a counterexample here. The number of children in the group is nine. And the number of children with a pet, again, <laughs> divisible by three, no, could be four and nine. So, um, yeah, cool, none of them. Uh, excellent. Number six. I like this question. I think a previous two paper has asked something very similar, but it could have been from somewhere else. I'm not sure. Anyway, what I did was I looked at the cos graph and said, okay, well, the solutions are at 90 and 270 right now. Um, what I can do is, thinking about this graph in terms of graph transformations is, is annoying because there are two horizontal-like transformations and they kind of interact with each other in a way that I don't really want to talk about. Um, so I, I chose to avoid that. What I did was I just solved, I just figured out where the roots of this thing are. So I just set it to zero. Cos inverse of zero is of course either 90 or minus 90. I only need the first two roots. So I'm just going to deal with those two. I don't need any of others. Um, and now we can find x in this case when we add 60 times by 2 divided by 3 we'll eventually get to uh, 100 minus 20. Now what that means is this transformed graph it obviously looks like a cross graph um, but it's got a root at minus 20 at 100, so it's been moved. Um, it's been shifted, well, it's been shifted and stretched, which is why it doesn't quite match up. But yeah, sure, 100 and minus 20. But all I really need to say here is that line of symmetry, I could say that's a vertical line of symmetry. I just need to say that that happens at this maximal point here. And the maximal point is halfway between the roots. So therefore, if one root is at minus 20 and one's at 100, add them up divided by two, and we get an average of 40. And, uh, and that'll be where our symmetry is, I think. Good, question seven. So we've got A bigger than B, sorry, A less than B, less than C, less than D, but they're all positive. 
which of these must be true? Well, A is less than C, uh, sorry, A is less than B, and C is also less than D, strictly, just from this bit and this bit. So therefore, A plus C must be less than B plus D, because uh, this one's less than this one, and this one's less than this one. So strictly, that must be true. Uh, for the others, we're just going to find some counterexamples, or at least for this one, we definitely are. We always want to be looking for counterexamples when you're looking for what must be true. If I just make the gap between D and C very small and the gap between B and A very big, then this will clearly be a counterexample. So, so that will do. And this one here, again, you can try and find counterexamples, but very quickly you'll realize B over C is less than 1 because B is less than C. D over A is bigger than 1 because D is bigger than A. So that one's also necessarily true, and uh, we'll end up with G as our answer. Here, um, when X is very, very big, you get 3 over an extremely large number, which is basically 0. So as x goes into infinity, y goes to zero. So it's either this graph or this graph. The only change here is whether or not it just goes up like this or whether it tapers out this side. So we think about what happens when x goes to negative infinity. Now, when x goes to negative infinity, 2 to the power of negative, a massive number is just 1 over 2 to the power of that number, which is just basically 1 over a massive number, so basically 0. Um, so this turns to 3 over 0 plus 1, which just goes to 3. And so this tapers off like this, and the answer will be d. Uh, for 9, now you can do this properly by finding the correct values of x that do this. Um, and you can do that by considering when this mod function does nothing, so when t is bigger than 4, and when it actually flips over, so when t is less than 4. Um, but actually, all you really need to do is say, well, uh, the mod t graph is just a v-shape like this, right? So all I'm going to do is move that four places to the right, and then three places down, and this graph looks like this, um, with a minimum point there. And now I'm just going to try and find lines, vertical lines, for which when I integrate, the area will cancel out and you'll end up with an integral of zero. So for example, if you put in a line like here somewhere, it looks like these two triangle areas might cancel out. And so therefore, there's, there's definitely a value of x that would do it here. But also, if you put a value way over here, this area will cancel, this area plus this area, I guess, will cancel with this big area underneath, and you'll still end up with a thing of zero. And those are definitely two distinct points. Um, you can also maybe use x as zero up here, but um, it says positive solution, so we'll, we'll stay down at two. Uh, for question 10, this is a classic. Everyone should have been shown this, I think. Um, on this line here, a must be is zero. Um, so when you divide by zero, this isn't necessarily true because you have this other solution, which is a must be equals zero, which is a equals b, which you already knew. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is true. Like zero times seven is the same as one times zero. So. Um, yeah, cool. Question 11 then. So we have these two piecewise functions that are 0 if they're on their multiples 5 and 7 respectively, and 1 otherwise. And then h of n is this combination. So let's just write out the first few terms here. h of 3 is 1 minus f of 3 into 1 minus g of 3, and so on. We're only going using multiples of 3 here. Um, now, the thing is though, f of 3 is just, it's just 1, right? Because 3 is not a multiple of 5. So that's just 1 minus 1 times, and then that's not a multiple of 7 either. So it's 1 minus 1. But of course, that's just 0 times 0, which is 0. And in fact, all of these are zeros. Um, they're all zeros until you get to a multiple of 5 or a multiple of 7. Now, the first multiple of 5 that's also, because of course, we're only using multiples of 3, is f of 15. So we get to that one. But then we realize, well, actually, just because f of 15 is now 0, because n is a multiple of 5, that's going to be 1 minus 0, which is 1. But then we're still timesing by 0, because 15 isn't a multiple of 7. And likewise, when you get to the first multiple of 7, which is also a multiple of 3, which is 21, should be some extra brackets here, apologies. Um, but anyway, um, it's just going to be still 0. It's just 0 times 1 instead of 0 times 0, like all these were. The only terms that are actually going to be 1 times 1, and therefore actually matter, are things that are multiples of 5 and also multiples of 7, except they also have to be multiples of 3. So we're just going to do 3 times 5 times 7, which is 105, and that will be the first one. And then we just have to count how many multiples of 105 there are up to 2007. Now, 105 times 20 is obviously 2,100, just doing some very quick maths. Um, if we take out down 105 from that, we get to 1,900 and something. Um, and so therefore, there are 19 multiples uh, of 105 within this range here that we'll be using. And that will be that question done. This is a lovely question. Um, just put in A is uh, 31. Just just work out what A31 is. Um, it's, it's A30, which I put in red, and I'll explain why. Um, plus minus 1 to the power 32, because you add 1 to this term. I'm just doing the A31 bit, times 31 squared. And then we're just going to take away A29. Now, you could modify A29 in the same way and write it out. But actually, the reason A30 isn't red is because the best strategy here, I think, is to now just do the same thing to A30. 
just say it's a29 plus minus 1 to the 31 times 30 squared. And the reason that works really, really well, so that's just this bit turned into these terms, everything else left the same, because now, it's, because now I have a positive a29 and a negative 1, so they just go away. And minus 1 to the 31 is minus 1, and then this is obviously positive 1. You can just write that as that. Difference of two squares it again as earlier, and it becomes 1 times 61, which is 61. Good. Question 13 then. So a little bit ambiguous, this question, but what it means to say is that polynomial P of X has two stationary points, X equals A and X equals B only. You're only allowed those two stationary points, um, which is probably should have said. Um, otherwise, the answer changes a little bit. But anyway, let's deal with the necessary first. So counterexample for necessary is to find the time when Q happens when P didn't. So therefore, P wasn't necessary because Q happened anyway. So I want um, this function to be decreasing between A and B, but not to have a maximum at A. And I can do that, right? I can just make an inflection. So it inflects at A, which is a stationary point, so that's satisfied, and then goes down. There should also be a stationary point here at B, but I couldn't be able to draw it. Um, but okay, that's it's, it's definitely not necessary. Now for sufficiency, we want to do the opposite. We want to find a, we want to find P happening, but Q not following. So it's not sufficient on its own to do it. Um, so we want a maximum at A, and then we don't want it to be decreasing all the way from A to B. Except if B is the only other stationary point, it has to be decreasing to get to B, right? Because it can't turn any earlier at any other point. Um, so it just it just has to be true. If you're allowed to have more stationary points, you can just go up and then you can wobble as much as you want before you get to B. Um, but uh, since these are the only two, I think, um, according to the mark scheme, this is the answer. So therefore, this, these must be the only two, I think. I think I'm getting that right. Anyway, sine squared is 1 minus cos squared, um, so we rearrange that, this factorizes, you cancel out with the top, and uh, and now we just say, well, we want to make this as small as possible, which makes making this as big as possible, which means choosing cos x to be 1, and uh, we get 1 third, and that question is super nice and super, super straightforward. Question 15 is a really great question, makes you do a bit of thinking. Um, now, this integral here, plus the integral from minus 2 to 0, must be this integral. Because this is the integral chunking from 0 to 3. If you add on the integral from minus 2 to 0, you'll end up with this whole thing, right? That's just how integrals work. You get one section plus the other section is the entire thing, right? Um, so therefore, this plus something is that. So therefore, it's 3, right? The integral between minus 2 and 0 must just be 3. This integral plus this one must just make this one. So that's cool. This one's interesting because of the f of minus x. It takes a bit of thinking. But if you just draw some function like this, and you say, okay, the integral between minus 3 and 5 looks like that. Let's pretend this whole area is 2. What happens when I flip this entire graph? In fact, let's pretend this graph is already f of minus x, I guess. Let's flip it all in the y-axis, of course, to make this. And now, how do we make the area still 2? Like, how do we make the area still the same? Well, we have to go all the way back to minus 5 to get the same part of this curve as 5 used to. And then we just have to go up to 3 to stop it at the same point that this one used to. So I think this is the same as the integral of f of x from minus 5 up to 3. And that's super useful um, because now we can combine that. Uh, which one do we combine it with? Do we combine it with this one, I think? Um, is it that one or do we, what did I do here? Or do I combine it with, which one did I combine it with? Uh, this one, over, sorry, this one way over here, right? This one and this one, right? Because this integral plus this integral must make that one, right? This one goes from minus 5 to 0. This one goes from 0 to 3. So the whole combination that must be this one here. So minus 6 plus 8 gives us the 2 there. So that's fantastic. We've got this one now as well. Um, and now we're going to combine that again. We, we're aiming to get to minus 2. So now I think we just need to use these two that we had before. Because we, I think what we can say is that this one to this one must be um, the combination. Or is it just the... No, it must just be this one minus this one, right? Because this is just going from minus 5 to minus 2. This one goes the whole way to 0. So if we do this minus this one here, we'll end up with what we need to get to, the, to, get to there. In other words, um, this one plus this one from minus 5 to minus 2 and from minus 2 to 0, this one plus this one must make this one. So minus 9 plus 3 makes minus 6, so it must be minus 9. Uh, really nice question, worth worth looking at, because Tamura does ask questions that use that kind of logic around it towards. So yeah, really lovely question. Anyway, uh, this by factor theorem means f of 2 is 0 and f of minus a is 0. Let's just deal with those both and simplify them. I'll trust that you can follow the maths without too much trouble here. We get these two statements. Uh, that's just, I think I just did this one minus this one, I think. Yeah, that's why I did. That looks right. Uh, move the 12 over, divide by 2. And we get a is either 3 or minus 2. 
Uh, a can't be minus two because A and B are positive constants. If A is three, that makes B uh, uh, plus 12. Uh, what does it make it? 24? 12, yeah, 24 minus 24. Yeah, it's 12 minus 24. Good. And then the difference between A and B is 20, is minus 21. 3 minus 24 is minus 21. Good. Uh, another nice one. Which of these is necessary and sufficient? One way to think about necessary and sufficiency and sufficiency is it, it has to make it happen, and it's the only time it can happen. So if we look at these first two conditions, for example, we have a circle, yeah, sense of the origin, radius A. If M was 0 and C was A, so C is A is here, right? It's the radius of the circle, and M is 0 is a flat 9. Now that's totally a sufficient condition to make a tangent, but it's not necessary because it's not the only time it could happen. You could be down there instead, which is actually what this rule says. But that still isn't enough because you could just have a diagonal coefficient anyway. Um, so both of those are gone. Now, these ones are much more difficult to deal with because you can't just draw them easily like I did there. So let's just actually do some algebra. Let's just shove this in there. And of course, to make a tangent, we just want to do another discriminant check. So we'll just um, expand this out and group the x's up like this. Skip some steps, but it's fine. B squared minus 4 c needs to equal 0. So let's work that out. And then just do some more algebra and some more algebra. These two terms go away, which is very nice of them. And then we can just group that. And it looks exactly like this last statement here, which is great because the discriminant check is a necessary and sufficient condition for tangents. So therefore, because this is a necessary and sufficient condition, and because we done just did some algebra, it means that this is too. So we're going to have E as the answer to that question. Really lovely question this. I used the uh, change of base law. I forgot to include a picture of Taylor Swift, which I'm annoyed about now. I could pause the video and edit, but I can't be bothered. So the change of base law says log to base whatever you want. Just imagine a picture of Taylor Swift here. I, I know I am. Um, of B divided by log to base Taylor Swift of A is, is C based on this thing here. Let's just change the base law. But C, um, sorry, but A is just B to the power C. And then I put C at the front here by the power law. And then you can just cancel out the log Bs and you get 1 over C is C, which means 1 equals C squared. The only solution to that while C is bigger than 0 is 1. Um, so C is definitely 1 and it's unique. Now A and B aren't, because if C is 1, of course, looking at this equation, anything equals itself to the power 1. And likewise, log to the base anything of anything is 1, as long as those things are greater than 0, I guess. Um, so we'll go with the answer of B. You, C is unique, but A and B are not. Question 19. So let's uh, do some standard completing the square on this one over here, and we'll end up with a circle radius 6, center 2 minus 6. So we may as well draw that. Looks a bit like this, and it has radius 6. And I think I had to guess here, but touch each other externally. Touch means tangent 2, not intersect 2. Um, externally, I, I assumed meant like this, right, where they kind of touch and one's on the outside, rather than being a big circle that kind of touches as it passes over whilst being bigger, I had to, I think that must be touching internally, because right? one's on the inside of the other, maybe, I don't know, I've never seen this language before, but it was pretty, it, it wasn't too hard to work out. It, all it's asking us is the radius of this little circle that, that's supposed to be touching, but I now see a little gap in, but whatever. Well, okay, well, the distance from the origin to this, to the, to the center here is just six squared plus two squared, which is root 40. And the radius is six of the big circle, so therefore, the radius of the little one is just root 40 take away 6, and that's 2 root 10. So it's just 2 root 10 take away 6, and that's that question done as well. Which of these is necessary but not sufficient? Now, this here is just, you would think of it as just the answer to this, right? You take away 1x squared bigger than or equal to 9, you're either side of the two roots. Um, so that's necessary and sufficient, right? If it's just the answer, it's necessary and sufficient. These are the, these are, this is the only time, well, between them, are the only answers for x, and it's all of the answers for x. Um, so, okay, that's that's necessary and sufficient. x is not equal to 0 is actually a necessary condition, right? The answer to this is not x equals 0. It's not sufficient, because x needs to be more specific than that. But it is it is necessary. It's necessary, but not sufficient, which is actually the answer, right? So we can underline it and move on. Just for completion, x bigger than 10 is sufficient, but it's not necessary, um, because there are lots of other things you could be. Um, but it is, it is sufficient. It will do. Um, x equals 3 is also sufficient, but it's not necessary. There are lots of other things you could do. And x bigger than 0 um, is not sufficient, um, and it's also not necessary, because as we saw earlier, you could be ne these negative numbers here. So the answer is B. That's the whole paper. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you for Jackie uh, for writing that. I will be. She's got two more papers for me to do, which I'll hopefully upload pretty soon.